Thank you very much, Al. It's a pleasure to be speaking to the BVA today, and if I may say, quite an honor. I've been the museum director at APH for the past 10 years. My job is basically to serve as kind of a human reference desk and be the public face of the museum. Now, I have a theater background along with my history degree, so I also do the occasional bit of museum theater, one man shows, telling the story of people from our history like uh, the, the blind bard of Kentucky, Morrison Hetty. And uh, a few years back, I made the mistake of agreeing to appear for a Braille challenge event as the Braillenita, an illiteracy fighting superhero in tights and fake muscles. <laughs> so when the BBA was planning its convention in, for Louisville, our company president thought it was a good idea to send me out here in full cassock and collar, dressed up as Father Thomas J. Carroll. You know, something nice and light, 30 minutes of fun. But to prepare it, I had to spend a month reading and rereading Father Carroll's speeches. And Father Tom did not come to this convention to drink a beer and reminisce. He said, often, that his position on your podium was not to speak for the BVA, but to speak to it, to speak to you. Now, in 2014, our museum received a pallet of boxes from the Carroll Center in Boston, basically Tom Carroll's life work. And we're now partnering with the Carroll Center to preserve these documents that reveal Carroll, the priest, the administrator, the healer, the counselor, the reformer, and the visionary. Carroll, the fellow who smoked too much, who ranted against fragrance gardens for the blind, and who loved to buy gadgets out of the backs of magazines. And my respect for Father Carroll the man is immense, and somehow I just couldn't bring myself to put on a collar and pretend. And my Boston accent, by the way, is pretty terrible. But what I did agree to do was to try and bring to you some of the flavor of his addresses and his passion for the BVA. Now, Carroll was your luncheon speaker for 25 straight years between 1946 and 1970. You loved him so much that in 1959, when he was hospitalized with phlebitis, he delivered his luncheon speech from a hospital bed in New York by telephone while the rest of you were in Seattle. His speeches had their own internal rhythm. First, his standard introduction. Members of the Blinded Veteran Association, their wives, their sweethearts, and their friends. And then a very brief but half-hearted attempt at an opening joke and an uncomfortable but sincere apology that he had nothing new to say, which was a lie, because he always followed it with something important, something challenging. Because he believed with all of his heart that you were fated for greater things. He was a mesmerizing speaker, his cultured voice vibrating with feeling, his loving concern for the BVA and its members obvious from the start, his righteous anger at the obstacles you face equally apparent. He described you as, quote, almost a part of me, unquote. Now over the next few minutes, now he never spoke more than 30 minutes and I won't today, I'm going to cut and paste from his speeches. Now, before I get into his speeches, I, I want to give you all just a little note about his language. 1946 through 70, or when those addresses were, uh, especially at the beginning, there were no women in the BVA. And so if Father's Carol's language is a little bit gender specific to men, please, ladies, excuse that. Uh, Father was a great champion of integration, um, as you will see. Uh, he strongly believed in that, but during his day when he talked about African Americans, he used the word Negro. I'm not going to change his words because I want you to trust that what I read to you today is, is, is his words, but when you hear that, you know that that's a word that uh, we don't use as much now to describe folks. So let's start in 1946. That year he used a favorite theme, the fight against injustice. It is seldom that we have to be reminded of our rights. It is all too often that we fail to remember our duties. Few of us have to be urged on to state our liberties. Most of us easily forget our co-relevant co obligations. 
You are, as Captain Alan Blackburn has often called you, a flying wedge. Your job is to dent that unreasonable and unreasoning reaction of the sighted public. And if you can more than dent it, if you can really crack it, thousands of others wait to rush through the gap behind you into lives of greater security and understanding. If the day soon comes that you have a strong influence on public opinion, factions will be tearing at you from the outside and trying to tear you into factions within that they may get control of you and your influence. The militarists and the pacifists will both want your aid. The empire builders and the appeasers will both seek it. You then are in a special position of responsibility. You then have special obligations. No need to tell you to work for peace, but to remind you that you must see and know where those paths to peace lie. You must be a course of truth. Yours must be to use again a phrase stolen and abused by both reactionaries and radicals. Yours must, in the best sense of the word, be the American way. Thank God you are fighting against race prejudice. May he strengthen your arm in this fight. And may you go on to fight against every form of injustice. The fight against injustice is an American fight, and in the van of that fight is an American banner. Too often we have allowed that banner to fall into hostile hands. Too often we have allowed them to carry it as a false front. The only answer that is compelling, the only answer that is truly worthy of the man who gave his sight for his country and for peace and justice is that you yourselves take up the banner against all injustices, that you carry it to the front where no one else has a better right to carry it. To 1948, on the meaning of heroism. While I was sitting back waiting to be called on, I had the chance to hear one of the other speakers telling about how proud he was to be addressing such a group of heroes. I sat back and shuddered a bit because I knew he had hit a wrong key. I'd be very much surprised if there are any among you who want to spend the rest of your life sitting around and being called heroes or putting on the hero act. When you've really been a hero, you know it yourself. In this business of heroism, there's one point where people often get lost. They do it with regard to blindness, forgetting all too easily that the guts that count the most is not the guts that get your eyes blown out, but rather the guts that keep you going forwards. It takes plenty to put you in a position where the shell lands or the booby trap explodes, but it takes even more to meet up with some of the things you meet up with afterwards. When heroism really meets its test, it's in the face of forgetfulness and ingratitude. Some of you have certainly met it, to agree all of you have. But what makes it hardest of all to be a hero every day is the attitude of those sentimental fools I talked about last year who seem to think that is somehow less a man if he has a physical imperfection. It's the emotional morons who seem to think that the measure of integrity is physical wholeness. The struggle is a long one and a hard one that calls for fortitude, for guts. You can't beat the selfish by being selfish, nor the ingratitude by shouting about it. You can't beat the sentimentality by being a sentimentalist, nor the emotionalism by mere emotional appeal. It's a daily struggle and a struggle that goes on within yourselves. It's easy to fall by the wayside. We all know that there are some who, for the public benefit, have waved a stump or polished a glassed eye. The remarkable thing is that so many go on fighting the battle. If you're a hero, you rise above the rest. You'll take the right way, even if you have to take it alone. But you won't have to take it alone and never lose sight of this. The way and the only way is the way for which you were put here, the way of love. And for each and every one of you, that way calls for manly love of God above all things and of neighbor as of self. 
Most of you have no need of proving it to yourselves or to anyone else that you are men. You have proved it once to your own satisfaction, and that is why you're here. What is true of you as individuals must be true of the BVA. You must keep it always founded on the fact, sure in your own minds, that you are men above the rest. From 1950, another familiar theme, Father Carroll's hatred of segregation in any form. I realize that blinded veterans have much in common and that from the occasional meeting there can be strength, but I say that to seek to be together all the time is to seek always to wear the splint, to be afraid to throw away the crutches of the rehabilitation time. For us in work for the blind, segregation is the easy answer. We could easily put all the blind in one place, institutionalize them in one building or in cottages, and there try to solve their problems. Certainly, it would be easier for us. The segregation of the blind is basically false. The notion is wrong at heart. Segregation from without, that's the result of intolerance, prejudice, bigotry. Segregation from within is the result of dependence. Segregation from within is the result of immaturity. Segregation from within is, and there can be no other word, surrender. Are blind people so different that they need to be set apart? Are you blind veterans so different that you need to be put where the public cannot look at you? Are you so different that you need to have your own way of living? Then what happens to the rest of us? to those who have other physical defects, to us who have mental defects, where is our ghetto? From 1955, Carol talks about his pride in the BVA. One thing I would like to speak of is my pride in the BVA, my pride in you. I spoke of you many a time during the war years. I spoke of you as a cross-section, a cross-section of the armed services of the United States, and thus a representative sample of your generation, of the rising, the growing generation, the group that was coming up. I was proud of that sample, hopeful for the country just from knowing you. Now don't let me seem to exaggerate. I'm not here to say that you're a great organization. You're not. <laughs> you're not a great pressure group. You're not a vast veterans organization. Your treasury, most of the time, is a flattened pocketbook. <laughs> there are millions of Americans who don't even know you. Yet I say that you have a greatness. I say you have a greatness that you don't even begin to recognize, a greatness that is in your history, the history of your action. It is in your public statements. It is the reflection of yourselves and of your thinking to the public. It is in the things you have done and in the things that you have tried to do. To you, the term blinded veteran has not been interpreted as it so easily might have been in terms of Jewish veteran or Christian veteran. It has not been restricted to mean the white veteran or the Negro veteran, but in terms of your own emblem, you have worked for the human rights of those who live under the Star of David as well as those whose banner is the cross of Christ and for the blinded man, the blinded veteran of every race. You have sought and fought for the rights under law of your membership and also of others who are not your members. You have gone beyond this in the things you have done for the civilian blind persons of this country that they too might receive equal treatment. No, your greatness is not in numbers nor in wealth. It is in the fact, if we may say such a thing of an organization, it is in the fact that the BVA is adjusted to its handicap is adjusted to its blindness.
Try that analogy for a moment. Think of the BVA as an individual. Think of the organization as a personality. The BVA wants neither special privilege nor second-class citizenship. It is no blind beggar to live off the public sympathy, nor is it a maladjusted braggart who seeks to throw his weight around. It is not satisfied with working only for self, but works for and with its fellows in the community. It has accepted its blindness without being overwhelmed by it and has determined, in spite of it, to be a part of the existing world, to make its place in that world and to make that world better. From 1961, on facing up to the severity of blindness. Blindness is rough. Blindness is rough. To me, any statement to the contrary are but escape words, running in fear from the truth. To me, blindness is a multiple and repetitive trauma which has effects ranging wide and deep. And I no longer have any time for those who would say it is minor, that is an inconvenience only. To me, there's only one starting point in our discussion of blindness, and it is here, that the handicap of blindness, though not the most severe handicap possible, is severe indeed. If we take this stand, if we find agreement that blindness is as severe as I have indicated, then we are at the crossroads point, ready to choose. On the one hand, we can say that blindness is so severe, so devastating that there's essentially nothing which can be done about it except to give the blind person something, something which passes for happiness. We throw him one or another sop, we pat him on the back and tell him that things could be worse. We arrange for segregated parties and outings where people are nice to the blind. We're satisfied to get some job for the blind person, probably a stereotype job, but almost certainly a job without the possibility of advancement. We avoid anything which would help him to look at his blindness for fear it might overwhelm him. We continue to run our agencies with amateur help, for trained personnel couldn't do anything anyway if the only problem is to keep them happy. We subscribe to the statement that only the blind can understand the blind and with it all keep these, quote, blind understanders, unquote, in minor positions. We play with one or another aspect of rehabilitation or reorganization, but avoid tackling the whole job. We place people before they are rehabilitated and then wonder what has happened when they fail but satisfy ourselves with the eyes that you can't expect too much anyway from these abnormal, normal people. I say to you that it is the understatement of the year to say that blindness is rough. It is frighteningly difficult. Yet, 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 I say that blindness can be overcome, that the blind person can be primarily a person, without blindness being his whole focus, that he can reorganize with proper concentrated assistance, and to use in your words that he can take his rightful place in the community of his fellows. But he can do this only if first he and we are willing to face up to the situation as it is, only if we are able to meet and look at the totality and the finality of the handicap in all its implications and overcome it. The rehabilitation which is demanded is a process of pain and repeated crisis, but it can have its effect. And that effect can mean a stronger individual. Certainly blind persons are not abnormal persons. But if I may take over the words of Dr. William Menninger, they are normal persons living under abnormal circumstances. And to meet those abnormal circumstances properly in the beginning, they need the very best of professional assistance that we can bring to bear. And then, if we have drawn our job properly, hopefully they will not need us again, nor will they need extraordinary benefits. In fact, these may keep them out of the very community in which we are trying to integrate them. 
For I firmly believe that work for the blind is at the crossroads, that we must first meet in the moment of truth in which we face up to the awesome severity of the handicap of blindness, and that then we must choose our path. Either the road of softness and escape where no real happiness in this world can exist or the hard road of truth to integrated independence in the world which is. And from 1966, when Carroll was talking about psychological adjustment to blindness, he also introduced this concept of blind power, blind power. But you have to understand his comments from 66 as written as the Vietnam War is getting into full swing and protests, especially on college campuses, against the draft and against the war are growing in strength. It is now many years for some of you, most of you, since you made that very difficult adjustment to blindness. Sometimes it was a very long road. You went up and you went down again, peaks and valleys, peaks and plateaus, before reaching an adjustment to blindness. But in a sense, this is true for all mankind, that each of us must make an adjustment to life, and each of us must make it again and again and again. You know that I think I despise the word acceptance of blindness. Sounds so much to me as if, well, the way many people use it, it sounds as if you were supposed to like it. And I don't believe that for a moment. The word adjustment is in many ways almost as bad. But look for a moment at some of the defenses we all use. Denial is a common defense. The problems are all outside us and within us, and yet we deny that they exist. We deny that they are burdensome. The flight to dependence is another easy one, and from it, of course, follows all too easily the subjugation of others, even their enslavement. With blindness, withdrawal usually means the withdrawal from sighted contacts, from the sighted world, withdrawal into segregation where blind groups remain together. And with this goes an increased, although smothered, hostility toward the sighted world and often those in the world nearest to us. There are many ways by which human nature takes flight and escapes, whether we are sighted or whether we're blind. And when this happens and when we see it happening, then it is time for us not to become introverted, but to find the professional help and counsel which can assist in a new adjustment. For adjustment to blindness, like all adjustment, is a delicate and continuing thing. For all persons, adjustment to life is difficult for every husband and wife, for every single person, for every young human being, every middle-aged human being, and every old human being, and it is not something once done and then forgotten. The impact of blindness on the public is something that we all too well realize and that most of you, all of you, have experienced to your sorrow. That emotional impact exists, and try that we will and must to soften it, Try, though we will and must, to put it on a rational basis. We still recognize it. It exists, and where it exists, we must use it only for higher ends. That emotional impact exists, and because of it exists the potential impact, the potential influence of the BVA. The impact, that emotional impact does exist, and this is the basis of what today I call blind power. I believe that in these years you have used it well, not for self-aggrandizement, not for the segregation of blind persons from other persons, or segregation of any persons, but for the rights of all. And now, increasingly, I suggest you are in a position to use it. This is not frightening, for I am not speaking of power gone blind, but of enlightened power, enlightened power that is yours, if you want enlightened blind power. Use it. Use it wisely and well. Join with civilian blind groups and in every way possible work for the equal rights of all mankind. 
And so finally, one of the most difficult adjustments for BVA in our day, most difficult of all in these days, I call on you to use your blind power to defend the American right of dissent. The tremendous difficulty, and at times actually it seems insurmountable, is to protect and defend this right on the one hand without on the other giving aid and comfort to the enemy. It is certainly too much to ask of this organization or of any organization that it spell out all the particulars of this. For the particulars are not for any consensus or any majority vote. They are too complex for such a judgment. Instead, the particulars require your individual thought, your individual judgment in conscience. But the principle is clear, and for the principle you can stand, one of the strongest American principles, always the right of dissent, but never aid and comfort to those who are enemies of lasting peace for all mankind. I return to your motto that the blinded veteran may take his rightful place among his fellows and work with them toward the creation of a peaceful world. Therefore, against blind force, against power, become blind by using your enlightened blind power positively for equal opportunity for all, for peace for all mankind, and peace in our time. from 1968, written amid the assassination of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy and riots in Baltimore, Chicago, Louisville, and the capital, DC. All around me I see tensions. I see the rising hate. I feel the racist fire. And I fear the time is too late, but in the name of Yahweh, we must try. Try to understand, try to make others understand, and then fight, nonviolently, but fight, fight against every racial slur, fight by word, fight by letter, fight by leadership, fight by vote, fight in your family and your community, but fight for one goal only, justice and love for all men. Oh, oh, if it's too late, and God forbid that it is, but if it is too late, then take from your lapel and take from your flag the BVA emblem. Throw far the Star of David, so long a symbol of the fight against persecution. If it is too late, cast deep the Christ, cross of Christ, no longer an anchor of hope for this country. Break the white and black hand, clasp where it becomes a fraud. Hurl out the broken bayonet. No beating into plowshares, for your hope of peace is gone. Take your service star and let the clouds encompass it. For if racial justice is lost, then America is lost. And all that you have fought and gave your sight for is in vain. The time is on us, but there is still hope if you work. I work and we work. And if God does bless America, no matter how little worthy we may be, there is still hope, for deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. From 1970. This would be his last address to you. And strangely, well, maybe strangely is not the right word, but his last three addresses were largely written in free verse, as is this last part. These are the last words of his final speech, his last public words to your group as a whole. That with the broken bayonet, the service star, the cross of Christ, the star of David, the American dream, we may work together, blind and sighted, minority and majority, each and every American toward the creation of that peaceful world where peace and love are. 
For where peace and love are, there is God. Peace. 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 Love. 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 God. 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 Be with us always. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you.